The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Allen & Heath webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's Nick Beretta here, Head of Product Marketing, and uh, I'm joined today by Ben Morgan, Product Manager for DLive. If you haven't attended any Allen & Heath webinar before, uh, just uh, one thing to notice. Uh, you will see a questions panel in your webinar interface, and you're welcome to use it throughout the webinar to send in any question you might have. We'll have a question and answers uh, session at the end of the webinar, and we'll try our best to pick up all of your questions. Now, this is a bit of an unusual webinar for us because we're not launching any new product. We're not releasing any new version of firmware today. Uh, what we're doing is we are here today to talk about the portability, the flexibility, and the scalability of the DLive system. We have some uh, amazing stories to, to share with you. And we'll start by having a look at how portable a DLive system can really be. So as you know, you can take any DLive surface. In this example, we have a C1500, so the most compact surface in the range. And you can use that surface with any DLive mix rack, for example, a compact CDM32. You can also um, put the, the surface in a, in a flight, uh, in a custom uh, lightweight flight case, and the, the combined weight of the surface and case can be within the check-in limit for any airline. So you can really uh, travel light with a C-1500 and check in on a flight. And in the last few weeks, I've seen a lot of activity on Facebook and social media, people talking about the C-1500 and how um, ideal it is for fly-in gigs and, and touring bands. And I, I took this post from the Australian user group of DLive, uh, where people are saying, yeah, uh, I couldn't do that with my S5000, for example, but with a C1500, I can pack it, I can travel with me on, on the van, on the tour bus, on the flight, uh, no problem. Of course, you can also choose to um, go completely surfaceless, so to uh, mix with a uh, DLive mix rack and, for example, a director software running on a laptop or, as we'll see later today, on a touch device, on a touch screen computer. Uh, or also use an iPad uh, with the DLive Mixpad app uh, and go completely wireless. If you want to have some real faders under your fingertips, then you can choose to combine Director or the iPad app with an IP8 or more IP8s for some tactile control. And you can custom assign any function to the IP8 faders. And later today, Ben will uh, um, run a little demo of how you can assign, for example, multiple mixes to the IP8. So not only you can control the front house sound, but potentially you can control uh, monitor mixes as well. Now, DLive is also a very flexible system. As I said, you can use any surface with any mix rack. And it's all mix and match which means that you can take C-class hardware and combine it with S-class hardware. They all use the same firmware. They all share the same language. So they can all talk to each other. And that also means that you can take any show file you created on DLive, for example, on an S7000, and load it on any other system with any other surface, any other rack or expander. And it will be compatible no matter what. Uh, as you can see in this slide, we showed a few examples of what racks and what I.O. expanders you can use with a C1500 surface. Um, and uh, yes, you can start with the most compact CDM32. You can choose to use a fully redundant S-class mix rack like the DM32 or higher. Uh, you can expand the number of I.O. Uh, using, for example, the new uh, portable stage box, the DX16-8. You can also use the C1500 with the, the new DM0 mix rack which will be supported by firma 1.6 um, in about four weeks time. Uh, the DM0 is a mix rack without any analog IO on board. Uh, it still has the S-class redundancy and three IO ports for your MADI or Waves or Dante connections. Uh, and of course you can expand the, uh, or you can add analog IO by uh, means of a DX16.8 or a DX32 modular expander and potentially multiply these uh, using a range of new uh, options that I'll show you in a minute. 
So the beauty of this system is that you can deploy the inputs and outputs where required, stage left, stage right, uh, with the amp rack uh, for the monitor amps, uh, anywhere it, where, where, where they are uh, needed. DLEV is also a very scalable system, as you probably know already. So we have solutions from zero to 36 faders, zero meaning surfaceless systems, and 36 faders on the largest DLEV S class 7000 surface. In terms of IO, again, as I, as I just said, you can use a number of new options with the Thermo 1.6 coming out soon. Uh, and for example, we have a new DX Link IO port module, which will allow you to uh, really multiply the number of potential DX expanders connected to a DLive system. Uh, the same applies to the DX Hub, which is uh, the same capacity, but in a standalone external module. And, and that means that you can have many, many IO points. Uh, I think we counted up to 48 discrete I.O. points or stage boxes potentially in a DLive uh, system. And that brings the, the total count of inputs and outputs uh, up to over 800 system inputs and 800 system outputs uh, that you can freely patch input to output uh, regardless of format conversion or sample rate conversion. The system um, uh, does all of that for you seamlessly. So. This is to give you an idea of how scalable the system is. Of course, we're here today to talk about portable solutions. So I'll hand it over to Ben, and he will go through some uh, very interesting examples of real-world um, use cases of DLive in this respect. Thanks, Nicola. OK, let's stay on the, um, <clears throat> the subject of scalability for a moment. Um, uh, this slide here. We're looking at the standing avian singer Zara Larson, you know, her engineer. Uh, Zara is currently on tour through Europe, um, performing at a combination of traditional venues and festivals. Now, b because of the different venues on this tour, like I said, the traditional venues and the festivals, they wanted a um, interchangeable system where the surface size could change depending on the space available at the venue, or whether it's a flying venue or just a traditional kind of tour date. So they work with um, a, a PA company called Parachute in Sweden um, to configure an interchangeable D-Live system. And what they went for, a S7000 surface for the DM64. Now that was used or um, configured primarily for monitors. They also went for an S5000 uh, with a DM48. And that was primarily for use of front of house. However, they also spec'd a compact C1500, which you can see uh, on the right-hand side of this slide here. Um, now, the C1500 was chosen for dates, like which were flying dates, basically. So there wasn't going to be um, necessarily the space to bring in a larger surface, or they wanted everything so compact and portable they could get it into the checking luggage on a commercial airline. Um, so again, as Nicola kind of mentioned earlier, all of our all of our hardware speaks the same language, our DLive hardware. It's all interchangeable. So from night to night, changing between surface frame size and between S and C class, it's it's not a problem. It's very easy to do. So again, C1500 um, is proving very popular for engineers who um, re require something very compact for flying dates. Now here, um, it's a case study, a, a group of engineers over in Norway, uh, between them they purchased eight D-Live systems. Each one of those systems was based around a C1500 surface and a CDM32 rack. Uh, in the slide here, you can see a couple of those C1500s in some very compact and lightweight flight cases. Um, again, just to emphasize C1500s, in a lightweight case, this is something you can take on most commercial flights with you due to the small footprint and its lightweight build. So again, C1500, this time with the Australian progressive rock band Northlane. Um, they were on tour in Europe. Now they wanted a completely flyable self-contained solution. So again, C1500, uh, this time that coupled with a DM48 mic track. Now, for the North Lane tour, they decided that they were going to mix front of house and monitors 
from the C1500, which really, I mean, underlines the kind of flexibility and the power that you have, even with a small footprint surface like the C1500. Now, you can see here their entire front of house monitor setup, flight cased up, and on a luggage trolley. Um, as you can see, it's smaller than a lot of suitcases that people go on holiday with. It really is a very, very compact solution. So it's quite an attractive looking case that they've got there. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, they got the case built by a British company called Scott Dixon. And here's the case. And as you can see, it's an attractive it's an attractive case in its own right it has trolley wheels a uh, extendable handle which makes it very easy for wheeling through the airport for instance um and also it's only nine and a half kilograms now you can see the c1500 on this slide to get it in this case side trims have been removed not only does that make the footprint of the mixer smaller, it also reduces the, the weight of the mixer somewhat. Now, the combined weight of this Scott Dixon casing C1500 actually comes in under 25 kilograms. So most commercial airlines have a limit, which is around about 25 kilograms um, if you're checking luggage. So this Scott Dixon casing C1500 comes in under that limit. Um, which I'm sure you'll agree is very impressive. Now, just as, as an aside, if you're interested in the Scott Dixon case, the web address is at the bottom of the slide here, scottdixoninc.com. Alternatively, just search for Scott Dixon C1500 case, and that should take you to the product page. So we've seen the C1500 in a, a few different scenarios there. Now, it, it, it's not uncommon for a engineer to take something like a C1500 out and still maybe need a, a bit more tactile control. Now, for those scenarios, we have a great solution, which is the IP8. Now, the IP8, as you probably know, has got eight motorized faders. You can have six layers. And you can use this as a surface extender, as what we would call a sidecar mixer, certainly in the analog days. Um, and, and a common usage of this would obviously be to have your bus masters, for instance, on the IP8, and have your input channels on the surface itself. Now, coming back to the kind of scalability message, uh, you, you can connect 16 IP8 controllers to a D-Live system. So, you can take something like a C1500 and you can augment it with IP8 controllers to add additional faders depending on the venue um, or depending on your requirements. So the IP8 isn't, it's not just for use with hardware surfaces, it can be used with uh, a virtual surface, so to speak. So, what we've got here in this example is DLive Director, which is our free editing software, which can be used online and offline, um, coupled with two IP8s. Now, it looks like it's running on a Mac Mini there, um, all in quite a compact kind of case again. Now, Director gives you all of the, all of the kind of functionality that you would get from a hardware surface. Um, and the IP8s give you that tactile control of the faders. So with a couple of IP8s and director, you're essentially getting a 16 fader surface um, in a very lightweight and compact form factor. Now, here's, here's an example of a director and IP8 system, again, boxed up in flight cases or pedi cases at the airport, ready to go to the next gig. And again, you can you can see how how small and how compact these systems are when they're cased up, and I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, D Live really is the most compact 128 channel mixing um, solution on the market. Now, some people may want an even more streamlined solution. So again, sticking with IP8s, how about 
a pair of IPH running with a touchscreen. So obviously running it with the touchscreen, again, running our DLive director software, running it with the touchscreen means you don't necessarily have to have additional space for a keyboard or mouse. You can access all of the menus via the touchscreen itself. And this is becoming more and more common. We're seeing this more and more regularly. And here in the slide, there's a couple of examples, as I just mentioned, dual IP8 setup with a touchscreen, and also a touchscreen laptop with a single IP8, which is an even more compact solution. So we're just gonna have a quick look at using IP8 with DLive Director. Now, one of the common kind of questions we get either via email or in our digital community forums is people wanting to use the IP8 for tactile control. Um, and then they program it up and then sometimes they're using it going, hey, I can't access SEMS on phasers. Um, you know, my phasers are always going to LR. I can't, I can't get, you know, inputs to my AUX or my effect SEMS or so on. Um, well, you can do that. It just requires uh, a little bit of programming as we're going to go over here. So what I've got here, I've set up, oh, excuse me, I've set up a virtual IP8. Now, up here, you can see I've got my fader set up in a C1500, kind of a virtual C1500, if you will. Now, I've got a number of input phases, and I've got a few buses. So by default, if I move my IPA input fader, you can see I've got the mix button here on LR. And I'm just, as you'd expect, changing the level of an input to the master LR bus. Now let's say I want to have um, control from my IP8 of inputs to an AUX. Now, the way I've done this, I'll just kind of talk you through it. I've set up a few scenes here. So, I've called them just for just for the ease of this demo. I've called them LR, FX1, AUX1, and AUX2. Now, if we were to look at, let's just take AUX1 for a moment. What I've done using our recall filter system, I've actually blocked um, parameters other than the IP8 here. So what that means, I can have a scene which only essentially contains the IP8 programming. Now, what I've done here, where you can program the IP8, you can see in these top button, this top row of buttons here, I've actually programmed scene recalls. So, scene two, scene three, scene four, now, I put my, I had a scene here called AUX1, which is scene three. So I've programmed that to this button here. So when I push this button, I've recalled the AUX1 scene. And as you may remember, the AUX1 scene, I've got it set up so it only contains the IP8 programming. So in this scene, what I've done, as you can see this fader here, I've got my fader going to an aux, stereo aux one. And so let's just have a look at stereo aux one here. You can see moving this fader is now adjusting my send to that aux. Now you may remember I've got this programmed up as a, as seeing effects one. So if I recall that, move the fader, it's not affecting my stereo warps. It is, however, going to my stereo effects send. So all we're doing here is we're um, using our, our very granular fi uh, filter system. Just to reiterate this. So you would block all the parameters. 
and just allow, for instance, IP8 number one in this case, we have those parameters blocked with the exception of the IP8. And then in each scene, let's just go back to a, the effects one scene there. And again, just to reiterate what I've done, fader one in this scene is effect send level, input one to effect send one. Now, that's just that's just a quick demo. Um, as you can imagine, with the kind of granularity that we provide with the recall filter system, you can actually do a lot of very cool things, not just with the IP8, just with the C1500 or any of our surfaces. But this gives you an example of how you can quickly set up SEMS on faders from an IP8, and then an IP8 could be coupled with a touchscreen or a touch laptop to give you full control over your mix from this very, very, very compact and portable form factor. So this brings us on to touchscreen mixing, which is something, it's, it's certainly kind of uh, growing in popularity. And it's something we've been playing, playing with in our office recently. Um, you can see here, quite an attractive, uh, quite an attractive looking system that we've configured upstairs. Um, it's, I've, I've put the model numbers in the bottom right in case you are interested, but it's, it's just off the shelf. PC hardware. It's not particularly expensive. It's not bespoke. Um, this is just off the shelf uh, Dell hardware. So we've gone for a pair of Dell S2240T touch monitors. And you can't see it here, but what we do have as well is a Dell Optiplex 3050 Micro, which is running the director software. Um, and this particular computer, the Optiplex 3050, um, not only is it very small, it can actually be visa mounted to the rear of a monitor. So it you get you could, depending on the size of your case, have the Optiplex mounted to the rear of the monitor. So obviously that looks great. Let's let's just have a look and see how it looks in action. So as you can see there, <clears throat> full access to all of the on-screen parameters and functionality via the touchscreen. Now, there are times when you may want to go even smaller, even more compact. Well, the great thing about DLive Director is it will run on any Windows uh, tablet. And here we have the DLive Director running on Microsoft Surface. Again, this is uh, something we're seeing more and more of our customers using uh, in very, very kind of high resolution, crisp display. Um, it gives you kind of easy access over all the parameters. You can use your finger, you can use a stylus, and it literally gives you the power of our D-Live system in the palm of your hand. So to kind of sum up the touchscreen, the touchscreen mixing with D-Live. The direct software is free of charge. Um, you don't have to pay for that. Um, so it's not a costly add-on. If you have any of our hardware, you can grab the direct software and get mixing with that straight away. Multi-touch, supported again, out of the box. Um, as long as your hardware, as long as your touchscreen monitor or uh, touch device supports multi-touch, you can grab multiple phases um, and start moving them independently. You can use inexpensive off-the-shelf screens and computers and network switches. You don't have to go for expensive um, bespoke solutions. You can just grab any kind of high, pretty much any high street computer brand and piece together a system uh, to meet your requirements and also your budget. Um, you can also uh, which is unique to us in the touchscreen mixing market is you can have a wireless connection from your virtual surface to the mix track. Um, so you don't have to have a lengthy Cat5 connection there. You can just use a Wi-Fi router. 
And of course, as you're probably all familiar, we have a uh, we have a few iOS apps which give you additional control. Um, and again, just incredibly useful for when space is an issue. So one last little case study here. This is one of our uh, engineers over in South America uh, mixing in a mixing in an area where space is very very tight indeed. Um, so to get around that, some uh, some kind of quite innovative kind of thinking here. A uh, touch screen used in portrait mode with the window director windows placed on top of each other, and you can see there just how compact that solution is. And he's getting full control there, faders and processing screen, all in the space of a standard off-the-shelf TFT touch monitor. So I hope you'd agree after looking at some of those case studies that the, the DLive system, flexible, portable, scalable, in fact, the DLive system, you could say, really does give you wings. As you can see here, with our, <laughs> with our um, good friend Tom Cruise. So, over to you, Nicola. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Th thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you for the demo. I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I hope that this, this short presentation gave you all an idea of how uh, DLive can compare, for example, to other touch based mm -hmm. systems on the market. Uh, we won't go through the details of the competition today, uh, but I think it's fair to say that DLive has a lot of advantages against other uh, touch-based mixing solutions. Uh, the channel count, uh, the system latency, and the fact that the latency is deterministic, so it doesn't change with uh, adding more or less plugins or compressors or preamp models. And the fact that we have all of those um, embedded plugins, the deep processing uh, models uh, built in the system on all of the channels, uh, available straight away without any um, need for licenses or dongles and so on. Uh, now it's questions time. So um, we'll start with a couple of questions that have uh, come through during the webinar and please keep sending them in so you, you have your uh, questions panel in the webinar interface. Use it to send in any question. Uh, we've got plenty of time to, to answer them all. So um, Daniel is asking if uh, IP8 would ever work with iLive, Ben. Do you want to address that one? Um, I'm afraid not, Daniel. Um, the uh, the IPA is um, at this moment in time it is specific to the DLive system. the The iLive system does have its own uh, range of controllers, um, some of which may still be available in the sales channels. But the IP controllers, I'm afraid, aren't compatible with iLive. Is there a limit to how many IP8 you can use in a system, Ben? Uh, there is a limit. Um, at the moment, you can have 16 IP8, uh, and I, from memory, I think you can have 16 IP6 connected to each instance of a surface. So um, you can also add IP8 in a mix rack, what we call a mix rack connection. Um, so you, yes, there is a limit. It would be 16 to a surface, 16 to a rack, um, which I, I would hope would be enough for most um, scenarios. Uh, there's a couple of people that are asking uh, whether they can get the recording of this webinar. And yes, we are planning to upload it on our YouTube uh, channel um, sometime next week. Uh, so others can uh, go through the recording and uh, uh, re-watch the webinar if you like. Um, uh, Alex is asking whether an IP8 can be used in an installation environment in terms of uh, controlling sound for different rooms uh, and remote access of a central rack. And yeah, absolutely fine, Alex. Uh, in, in fact, uh, we have a range of IP controllers, not just the IP8. We have the IP6. We have a new IP1 IP wall plate controller, uh, which is designed for um, source selection uh, of music source selection and level control in a room. Uh, all of these are online on our website. We have a special section of the DLive uh, website with uh, the DLive installed solutions. So you're very welcome to uh, take a look at those examples. Um, now, there's a question from Mikhail about uh, the iOS app, the uh, Mixpad, and the fact that the faders are attached too small for, uh, for, his, uh, for his fingers. Um, uh, do you want to explain how you can uh, use the increased resolution on the, on the Mixpad faders, Ben? 
Um, okay, well, I mean, with the mixed pad faders, um, what you can do is, right, you don't just have to do your kind of standard up and down movements um, to change the fader level. You can do that, um, and it will work fine, but it may be in too coarse an increment for what you're trying to achieve. So if you do find that you're having issues um, moving the fader to exactly where you need it to do, you can bring your finger across um, vertically from the fader, um, and the fader will stay selected, and then you can move your finger there, and what you'll find is moving your finger in that way will make much more... Um, there will be smaller increments in the movement of the fader, allowing for a more kind of fine-tunable selection or adjustment of the fader or the parameter. Um, we have a question about latency in our effects system. So as I said, uh, all of our deep processing um, embedded compressors and preamp models and GQ models don't add any latency whatsoever. So everything is already compensated in the system. Uh, but someone is asking about Dynate and the effects rack, which do add some latency. So uh, that's obviously worth pointing out. Uh, the Dynate in particular, that's four samples of latency at 96 kilohertz. So we're talking microseconds, which compared to external plugins where uh, typically you can go to several milliseconds of latency, um, it's, it's really nothing. Uh, with the effects, it's a bit different. It depends on the type of effect. Um, we are looking at uh, posting or, have, or publishing a knowledge base article with the details and, and the, the measurements of each effect so that uh, you can uh, you have the, the confidence of knowing exactly what latency you are and you could um, potentially compensate for it with the, with the channel delays. Um, uh, how did you get director to view as two windows? How do you separate the touchscreen window in director then? Okay, um, well, I'll show you. I'll quickly flick over to director here on the screen. Now, by default, let me just move this a moment. By default, the kind of um, the, the kind of virtual touchscreen view resides in this little section of the screen here. But it is entirely possible to separate that into a different window by system menu. You can see here touchscreen options. Um, you can enable window mode here and then select a size. So if I just enable that a moment and hit apply. So now when I click on the window here, it brings it up in a dedicated window. Now, of course, that frees you up if you've got two screens, you can move this onto your upper screen, or if you're working as that customer in South America was with a screen portrait mode, you can place the two screens on top of each other, which can it is brilliant for maximizing um, the, the well, maximizing the use of your screen real estate. Uh, Ron is asking if you can link to IP8 together for page switching, so for layer switching, um, so that when you uh, switch layer on one IP8, it will switch on the other IP8 as well. I don't think that's possible at the moment. Um, no, I don't think it's quite possible in that way. Um, you could, of course, do it. Um, you could do it via a scene um, with the configurations of the IP8 different in each scene, and then have the scene recall assigned to a key, a little bit like I was doing earlier um, with the Samsung phaser. So yeah, you could do it like that, but with the layer buttons at the side of the IP8 at the moment, you, you can't link them in that, man, um, in that manner at the moment. We have a question from Anson asking if uh, we're planning for any controller with both faders and knobs. Um, not at the moment, Anson. Um, we are obviously always listening to ideas, um, so uh, we there might be other products in future that we can consider. Um, for the time being, we decided to focus on the IP8, IP6. And of course, uh, when you want to couple some uh, controllers together and possibly with a screen and with some analog I.O., then uh, straight away you've got a C1500 control surface, which, as we've seen today, is a very compact uh, solution as well. Um, uh, 
Someone is asking about uh, plans for uh, upgrades to the uh, iPad app and whether or not it will get the full complement of controls, effects parameters that you get in Director. Again, not something we are developing at the very moment. Um, it can be considered for the future. Uh, as Ben explained today, Director can be used on tablet devices like the, uh, the Microsoft Surface. So if you're after a very portable wireless solution that can control all of your mixing system, uh, then you can use Director uh, that way on, on Windows tablets. Um, someone is asking if you can link DLive desks together for greater fader count. Um, well, we have some uh, um, updates coming uh, for you all in 1.6 firmware, um, including uh, the use of multiple surfaces on one mix rack. So that's that's news for next month, but. Um, stay with us and uh, we'll share more news near the time. Is there any possibility of an eight input expansion rack and an eight output rack? Um, again, Ben. Um, <clears throat> not something our R&D team are working on at the moment, um, but by all means, send us suggestions because it's always interesting to hear what, what the market's interested in. Yeah, there's a lot of questions coming in on, on the DLive system in general and plans for the future. Um, we'll keep going through some of these, um, but ultimately we can also respond to your questions offline, so we'll send a few mails out uh, to people that ask questions. Um, Fred Thomas, our friend uh, Fred from the Netherlands, is asking um, uh, if the IP setup is stored in the mix rack or in the surface. Well, the, um, the IP configuration is actually saved on a scene-by-scene -scene basis. Um, and the, the scenes are obviously kept in the you know the show and the scene is all kind of mix rack based. Now, I, I guess there is a potential for confusion there because you can connect an IP8 in either surface mode or rack mode, um, but that's nothing to do with the physical connection. Um, so the IP information is basically just saved in the scene and will always be in the show, which is saved all of that in the mix rack. Um, another friend of ours, um, Ian Barfoot, uh, is asking of um, any plan to extend the uh, the input count and double the input count on our dealer <laughs> system. So, Ian, here we are talking of ultra compact solutions, and straight away you go into 256 channels of mixing, uh, which I know is uh, is your uh, daily routine. Uh, but no, at the moment we're not planning to expand the the channel count of the D Live. Um, Sidechain routing possibility. Um, I guess that is a sidechain as in sidechain for compressors and, and gates. And uh, yeah, that's part of the DLive. Uh, ben, if you want to uh, maybe bring up the, the, the touch screen view. So yeah, we're just bringing up, <clears throat> excuse me, just bringing up director here. So, here, sidechain source, um, you can select a number of different sidechain sources here. Um, so, yeah, that's already in there for things like the compressors. Um, it is just a case of clicking on the uh, sidechain source dialog box and then using the drop down to select where you want to grab that sidechain input from. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um... I think we covered most of the questions. Uh, there's one question about uh, managing PFL with uh, our director system. So if you're mixing with a touch screen, for example, and no surface, uh, how do you get to listen to your uh, monitoring, to your PFL system? Um, that's a good question. We get asked this quite a lot. Now, I've just brought up on the screen here um, the director view of the PAFL screen. Um, you can see you've still got PAFL control from director, so you can PAFL channels. Um, now, of course, the difference between director on a laptop and a C1500, for instance, is you don't have that headphone socket to plug into for your PAFL audio. So instead, what, what you do, you've got a few options. Um, you can, let's have a look, let's say we've got a mic track here, route your PAFL bus to a, a couple of outputs, for instance, on your rack. And then what you can obviously do is from those analog outputs on the rack, you could use a wireless IEM 
um, system of your choice, which would give you uh, IEM monitoring at your front of house position. If you needed more I.O. at the front of house position or you didn't want to use a wireless solution, um, you've then got another couple of options. You could use one of our smaller DX expanders, like the 16.8. Um, have that hooked up to the rack, which would give you a, um, a number of analog inputs and outputs at the front of house position. Uh, alternatively, another uh, method that we've um, had talked about is actually routing the path of audio back via Dante to the computer running the director software. And then you can use something like Dante Via to break the audio out to a to an audio interface. Um, and you then plug your headphones, for instance, into that. Um, using Dante Via may incur a small amount of latency. Um, you, you probably want to check that out before you dived in and used it. It may or may not be an issue. Um, obviously, the wireless and the DX um, solutions uh, wouldn't incur that quite that amount of latency. Uh, ben, where is the best place to install a Waves 3 card for multi-track recording, in the Surface or in the Mix Rack? Um, th th there's really no difference in terms of where you can grab the audio from or what audio they can access. The decision would really come down to um, really the location of your uh, the rest of your kind of sound grid equipment or where you're recording to. Um, so it it will work perfectly in the surface, perfectly in the rack. Um, I would just put it where it's most convenient for connection to your recording computer. Um, and finally, there's another question from Rowan about the use of a mix rack to run multiple rooms in an in a, in install environment. Uh, for example, side rooms, breakout rooms uh, with multiple IP controllers for control. And again, yeah, that's absolutely possible. Um, and again, I would invite you to have a look at the uh, DLive in install solutions on our website uh, where we share a few examples of um, um, uh, use of DLive in installed uh, sound uh, with IP controllers for managing uh, multiple rooms, multiple setups. Uh, let's have a look. Um, Yeah, more questions about, uh, well, questions, product suggestions and suggestions for, for features, which uh, we will all take on board and, uh, and add to our very long list of feature requests, uh, as I'm sure all of you um, uh, know we have. Uh, so I think we, we covered most of them anyway. And um, I want to thank you all for uh, taking part in this webinar. Uh, it's good to see all of these questions coming in and all of this interest in, in DLive. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us today and goodbye. Bye.